this way. In this episode, we talk about drugs and addiction. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction, please call the Alcohol Drug Information Service on 1800 250 015 or Narcotics Anonymous Australia on 1300 652 820. Both these hotlines provide confidential support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All right, we're back. Yeah. Episode two. Here we go. Why do I feel this way with Kate DeRouge? For those listening, who is this random voice? I'm your friend, Claudia. Not random. <laughs> Very important. Very important. Very important. One of your best friends, you might say. Well, yeah, and you're here to help me tell this story that I needed some support in telling. Yeah, and it's an honour. It's an honour. And, you know, last episode we spoke about kind of your upbringing, your school experience, um, the fact that you've never felt quite comfortable in your body. Yep. Um, Veneta, who is a fictional character. I'm convinced she's not real. No, yeah. she's, in, she's very real. <laughs> How you went and lived this beautiful woman who kind of you know helped you in your singing journey. You auditioned for Idol twice and get through, not to rub it in. The third time you did and yeah. we left off episode one um, where you've just gotten through to top 25 in Idol. Yeah, what a moment to leave. Mm. Um, so... From there, um, for those of uh, don't know the process of Idol, so um, it gets to the, the top 25 and that's when the live shows start um, and it's the first time that the fate of your position in this competition um, is handed over to the general public. What's more confronting, just quickly, three judges right in front of you being like, you're shit or you're good or whatever, or the whole of Australia voting? Well, I think because, like, To actually imagine, and I'm not exaggerating where we were in a time then where like reality television was new, right, and it was all exciting and the view, like the ratings were huge and it wasn't just hundreds of thousands Mm. or it was millions of people um, back then um, were the ratings for those shows. But it was hard to understand that on the other side of these cameras were millions of people. So I think the judges, um, that it was more confronting to be st- and they still commented like they may have not been in charge but their comments were certainly still there yeah um so yeah there was um there was that uh the last step to to get into the the top 12 and um i sang a song by stevie wonder um can you give us a snippet um for once in my life I have someone who needs me, was the song I sang. I someone remember I needed you doing so that. long. <gasps> for once. Oh, I love that song. Anyway. Um, I literally remember you singing that. Yeah, so that was that was the song that I sang. And it, it, so it was live on the Sunday. The performances were on the Sunday. And then you had that horrendous 24 hours of waiting um, for the results the next night. Um, and I went back on the Monday night and much to my absolute Shock horror! Um, I was one of the two that made it through to the to the finals, and that was it. That was 12. it, mate. That was you're in. I was in like Flynn. Although again, like, uh, and I and I'm and I guess I keep bringing this up, um, but it's a fairly consistent story and a fairly consistent thing for me through my whole life. Is I still didn't believe, despite the evidence of mm. of a public vote um, and people believing in me and, and and obviously enjoying my performance and enjoying what they heard, I still was like, there's been a mistake here. Like, I don't belong. Um, and just always doing that comparison of comparing myself, like in that group that I had to sing up against, I would listen to everyone's performance, like, oh, they're better than me. Yeah. That one's better than me. Oh, that one did this one. And, and never just, you know, always not feeling like I stood up or, or – um, could come close to, to other people. And isn't it funny because you literally had Australia behind you, quite literally voting you, spending 50 cents to vote or whatever it was, voting you in week after week after week, got you all the way through to the end and yet you still didn't have that, I no. deserve to be here. No, all the evidence that I could have needed was there but it was still like, no, there's been a mistake or it's luck or or whatever the story was but it was just – to me, shockingly unbelievable that I was standing there. And that continued every week, you know mm. what I mean? Like um, every week I would front up and I would rock up and it would be that thing of, oh, well, this has been a fun time, you know what I mean? But um, this will be me, this will be my end of this journey and what a wild ride. Was there much competition within – And I know, I know it was a competition, but with the top 12, was there any kind of spice behind the scenes or was it you're all kind of nice to each other and – 
support each yeah. other. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I know. I know. I had competition, and there was a like. There was a part of me that was like, I've just got to knock out this one, and then knock out that one. Yeah. And I'm sure everybody had their own internal competition, but it was just all nice and yeah. sweet and bullshit. You know what I mean? It was all that fluffy, yeah. lovey feeling, and everybody was. Um, you know, devastated when the other one left. But the truth is when somebody else left, you're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> woo, thank God. I love that moment when yeah. it's like when it, like whether it's Big Brother or Idol or whatever and it's always like the person who got through and they like turned to the person who got eliminated. They're like, oh, my God. I'm so sorry. And you're like, no, you ain't. Uh, I'm, I'm so sad for you. Mm-hmm. You're like, thank God it wasn't me. Yeah. Um, we yeah. can't talk about Top 12, though, without talking about that night and that comment. Of course, and it's um, – it's. It was never forgotten, was mm. it? It was a pretty big moment. I mean, I don't think I – I certainly know in the moment that I – it wasn't as shocking to me as it was everybody else. But, um, you know, there was that night I – th- I think we were about halfway through. It was rock week, I think. And um, I sang I Want It All by Queen. Um, and Kyle, at, at the end of my performance, basically said um, – I didn't really hear any of you singing. You just all I could, you know, cover up those tuck shop lady arms, which was so shocking to everybody. And if you can, you imagine saying that on on national television? I don't think you could today. I, I literally don't think. I think that legally would that would be no, not allowed. Um, but yeah, you know, it was it was that time where it was okay and encouraged for you. Well, not encouraged, like it was pretty much expected for you to look a certain way. Mm. Um, you know, we were living in that time of um, where magazines only had those perfect bodies and those skinny women and your Paris Hiltons and 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 that was the look and Kate Moss and it was mm. um, it was who we were expected to be and anything other than that was it was almost like it just wasn't acceptable you were 18 at the time on national television um but what was going through your head when you heard it um you know as i said it it was much more shocking to everybody else in that moment um than it was me like as a as an adult now having done the work i've done and having healed and and having to unpack a lot of the traumas um and shame like major shame moments that have happened to me over the time i can see that it was wrong um and that it it should have hurt me a lot more than it did. But I guess in that moment, like I'd already been whipping myself about my body for 10 years, you know what I mean? So it was kind of just another moment where it confirmed to me that my body was disgusting and it wasn't acceptable or appropriate to mm. be shown. Um, so, yeah, sadly, it, it didn't affect me the way that it maybe should have, um, on a conscious level anyway. I think on a subconscious level it certainly carried with me and funnily enough you will never see me or very rarely will you see me rocking a, a sleeveless top. Um, because of that night. Because of that night. Like I hate my arms. They're one of my um, most unloved parts of my body. But I guess the funny part of that story and the bit that nobody knows is um, after the show was finished and we were all backstage, um, you know, Kyle came up to me and he said, Oh, I'm really sorry about that comment, but you sang like shit, and I didn't want you to get voted off. So, I just threw that comment out and to get a sympathy vote. To get a sympathy vote, um, it's so calculated, isn't it? Like, because it, it's so it's. I remember because you, you've, you've told me this before, and it was quite shocking because I'm like, that in no way came across when he said the comment. It was more like he was just being an ass. Y- yeah. Well, he gets paid a lot of money to be an ass to an 18 year old, and to think that it was that calculated where he's like, "Oh, I actually like her. I want to keep her in." And I'm not saying I'm not condoning what he did, but like to try and get your sympathy vote to keep you in because you think he's saying not that great on that night is so like so weird. It's very interesting. Well, I mean, for whatever reason he said it, I guess is irrelevant. I guess the message in that is yeah. like got to be really careful what you say about people's bodies like it can it can really scar and damage somebody um and like that I guess on a subconscious level like that comment never left me and all it did was I just put it in my backpack of of you know stories and information and and that you know catalog of of Mm. confirmation that I was not okay as I was the comment happened we'll move past that now because it's a couple weeks on the track you're at the opera house the Sydney opera house there's, I would say, thousands of people at the grand finale. Maybe hundreds. Hun- maybe, it well, seemed like thousands. No, there were. Like in, the, in that four, like yeah. out the front of, like inside, I don't know how many people the opera house holds, but outside, yeah. like there was a sea of people. It was packed. It was outrageous. And you win the competition. Like literally Australia has voted you the winner of Australian Idol. 
Like, it's massive. Yeah, you know what's really weird as you say that to me? Like, I still don't feel... I don't feel much attachment to that. Yeah. I don't have – I feel like I should be <laughs> like, I do that? well, that was the proudest <laughs> moment of my life. But, like, I don't – I don't feel attached to that. Maybe it's because of that thing of just not being able to be in the moment and present. Mm -hmm. But, like, at the, you know, Emily and I were there together and we were the underdogs, as I said. You know, nobody – I don't think anybody expected us. I certainly didn't expect me to be there at the end. Um, and the last thing I expected to ever hear in my life was, and the winner is Kate de Rouge. Um, and you know, that moment that you see on the stage, um, of me winning, like that shocked beside myself look is, is super real. There's no, sh there's no show on that. Um, and you know, just a fun fact, if you ever get a chance, go and watch that footage, but watch the reaction of the judges when they flash to them. You know, oh, really? Like, yeah. Go and watch it. It's, it's interesting. It, I don't think anybody expect, including them, you know what I mean? I don't think it was, no, it was a shock to everybody, put it that way. Watch that footage one day. It's an interesting one. No, I'm going to watch it now. Go and pause watch this it. For a second. Just pause. No. Go and watch it. So you go, okay, so you've won Idol. You're 18 or 19 at this point. Mm. Um, you talk about how kind of like it was just a whirlwind from there, right? You yeah. just like thrust into the spotlight. You, I would dare say back then you were the biggest Australian celebrity at that time because Idol was so massive and most of Australia had voted for you because obviously you won by majority vote. So you have just legions of fans everywhere. Yeah, and I guess it wasn't until after that, you know, the grand finale happens and the confetti goes off and all the – you sing the winning song and it's all amazing um, and then this person that you've never really met who you've forgotten that you signed a contract for three months ago actually technically owns you now and you start this relationship with this person um, and he was my manager and his name was Dave, uh, David. And that was the beginning of the next chapter, you know what I mean? And that's when things – really changed and I don't think anything can prepare you for that that time in your life like from there basically you know the next day you go out and do 75 or however many interviews you're there from like 5 a.m till 8 p.m at night and you're just in interview after interview after interview um and from there it's fast um so you've got to learn like in that first week I recorded an album I did a film clip the maybe tonight film clip mm. Um, I travelled to different states and did, um, you know, performances and all of that. So you're trying to get used to this whole new world outside that safety of that idol bubble, which you are. You're safe and you're tucked away and you've got no concept of what's actually happening out in the world. Um, but all of a sudden you're walking down the streets of Sydney and there's people yelling at you, you know mm. what I mean? I There were people yelling at me good and bad there were people who loved me and like yeah okay we love you and they were like you shouldn't have won so it's it, it was super confronting yeah um and super new and and like i still find it hard to believe sort of as you said even if it was for only 10 minutes like i was i was probably for a second there one of one of the most well-known faces in this country 100 percent. this is before streaming it's before like said, social media wasn't really a thing like Really, it was just that was our first taste of reality TV, yeah. and and we'd put you on that you know on that grandstand, we'd, and we'd we'd crowned you our Australian Idol. Yeah, you know you were the people's. I was person. the people's person. <laughs> they chose me, which you is know? still which is still a hard pill for me to swallow. And I think there was actually a story that came out at some point, um, which again just went in my backpack of like, see, you didn't deserve it. It was all a hoax. I think there was actually a story at one point um, in the media where it was suggested that my dad paid half of Bendigo to vote for me and I was like see I told you I didn't mean to win um but yeah it was Bendigo. it was yeah go for because we're so huge here in Bendigo <laughs> we out we outweigh the rest of Australia but like I believed that shit yeah um so yeah look Idol um and and the time after Idol is is when it is when life changed and uh, I guess, you know, I um, I was still nursing that high level of insecurity and fear. Like I was just scared all the time and I mucked up all the time. Like I didn't know that you had to wear high heels and a full face of makeup to 6 a.m. breakfast radio. No one, to, no one mentioned right. that to me. You know, I'd rock up in my trackies and a thongs and, and a jumper with my hair in a messy bun and like, you know. She's I just, relatable. She's a relatable queen. Well, we love yeah, it. but they didn't like that back then. They wanted to, it wasn't really on brand. Be less relatable. Yeah, be less relatable, more <laughs> yeah. like that magazine says. Um, yeah. And it was really confronting and I 
was trying to learn. But in 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 that time also, like I met people, mm. um, and I guess this is where the juicy part of this story begins. You know. Well, I want to talk about your. You've had a couple of surgeries and yeah. procedures to your body, so I want to know how we got from eighteen, nineteen year old, stunning, gorgeous, top of the world, Kate on that yeah. um, stage at the Opera House. Where did the surgeries come from? Yeah, look, I guess it was it was as we spoke about, like it was that time of fat girls didn't get gigs, and and I don't think looking back now, like I was, I certainly I got a lot bigger, you know what I mean? I, I certainly wasn't a giant gigant or anything, but I I had a bit of puppy fat, and I wasn't I wasn't that stereotypical look, um, and so you know, my record label and my um, management were I, I i floated the idea of um liposuction and they were very supportive of that you know what i mean so i guess i think i want to say 19 certainly i might have just been 20 i had my first major operation or did my first severely drastic measure to try and have the body that i thought that i needed um so i had full body lipo um which is a massive thing. Like if you don't know what lipo is, that's like, it's it's, it's how do they they like, like go into? Well, they essentially stick a giant probe under your skin and vigors like yeah, and suction fat out um, from your body, and it's um it's very invasive. And I guess I didn't even really worry about what sort of level. I didn't. I I wasn't interested in the amount of pain. I'm sure somebody warned me about it, but I was like, I don't care. Just make me thin. Like mm. whatever. Just give me the thin. Um, and I guess I went into that operation thinking that I would come out the other end with all my problems solved because I'd be thin and I'd look a certain way. Um, and that just wasn't the case, you know what I mean? So you kind of – you had the procedure. I guess you were inside for a couple of weeks. You come out, you got a red carpet, the Young Divas kick off, and it's like nothing's happened. Nothing's happened, just as you were, carry on. Yeah. And look, I think it, it – did liposuction work? I'm sure it did to a degree. Had to. They removed something. Um, mm. But would I recommend it as a solution to your body problems? No. Not that long after um, I won Idol, I was introduced to some people um, within the industry, um, which were cool, you know. And they were people, um, you know. And and the industry. And I don't blame anybody for introducing me to drugs. I feel like if it hadn't have been them, it would have been somebody else. Um, but I. Um, I was, yeah, introduced to some people and cocaine was pretty common um, and I think it still is. Like it's been a minute since I've, I've used drugs or certainly been in those sorts of scenes anyway. But, um, you know, I was, I was offered some coke and, and, I, and I did. Mm. Um, and, you know, I look back now and I, and I remember um, – even though it, it didn't become an everyday thing from the first time I used, um, the obsession and the compulsion, not that I realised it at the time, but was there from from the get-go, you know what I mean? And I feel like all those all those worlds aligned at the same time and I'd found this thing that, that gave me somewhat of a solution to all of these horrendous things that I'd been carrying around with me, you know, that in those insecurities, um, you know, not feeling like I belong, not feeling like I was cool, um, you know, inhibitions and all of that stuff that I battled every day. All of a sudden I had this magical thing um, that I thought was the answer. Um, and I do, I remember that night just not having one or two, like having line after line after line after line um, and or and just being asphyxiated on where that where it was and when when the next one was going to be offered and mm. was the bag nearly empty and when the bag nearly was empty feeling that that anxiety that like well, well where's where's the next one so by the time divas came around you'd already kind of had some big milestones you know we talked about lipo you've you started taking drugs a bit more regularly you're saying it's more of a party thing at this stage but still quite regular yeah and then Young Divas comes yeah. along. And do the other girls know kind of what was going on behind the scenes with you? Um, no, I kept it pretty quiet. I mean, we were all on our own missions and it was a busy time. And, and those girls, and not like they, they knew how to have fun like uh, um, themselves. And, 
Um, not and I'm, just let me clear that up. I'm not saying they took drugs. No one took drugs. I'm not saying anybody took drugs. It, it kind of sounds like that. <laughs> no, okay. no, let me just clear that up. No. Okay. Um, but you know they knew how to have a party and they knew how to have a drink and yep. and and have their own fun. But I I would I didn't get involved in that. You know what I mean? I would. I would get separate and go and go home and, and do what I did behind closed doors. And, and yes, drugs weren't an everyday thing for me at that point. Um, but if I wasn't using them, I was thinking about the next time I was going to use them. And it was just coke at this point. Yeah, coke, coke and some. Yeah. And, and and I say that, and I don't say that flippantly. Like no. all drugs are bad, and no drugs are better than one another. And I don't recommend anybody take drugs. Let's also get that really yeah. clear. Um, but yeah, they were. I guess somewhat of a more acceptable drug, you know, that I was, it was cocaine and um, the occasional pill at that point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, the Young Divas was a, was a whole other time and, and we did amazing things. You guys blew up. Yeah. That this time I know, oh, I still love that song. Go on, hit me with this that. This time yes. I know, I'm going crazy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I should have been Where in that group. Where were you? I know. Jessica Malboy, what? Pull me out of year six. Get me on that stage with them. You know what I'm saying? No, I uh, loved you guys. That was You were a fun group. That was a fun group. It was fun and it was exciting. And like at the end of the day, you had these four girls that all within their own right could sing. Mm-hmm. Not that I believed that, but, you know, everybody. Wait, you didn't believe that you could or that they could? No, that I could. <laughs> <laughs> try. Drag them. No, no, not at all. Like, I, you know, I guess bringing it back on a more serious note, like everybody knows the Young Divas were as amazing and I feel like there's a whole episode we could do about the Young Divas and what happened behind the scenes um, there. It was pretty wild. Um, as you can imagine, with four girls, you're just four um, young divas, just though. Four you know what I mean? Living their lives, their things, all with their own agendas and, yeah. and and all of that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, for again, for a girl who didn't really have the ability to back herself, hated the way she looked, um, felt insecure about her body, you know, that was a really toxic space for me. Well, we talk like even putting yourself on a national st- like stage as idol. When you already feel uncomfortable in your body, you're already insecure and I actually think it's quite brave for you to put yourself out there like that. And then on top of that, you put yourself in a group of four girls where you're all stunning. But I imagine there'd be some natural competition when you put four girls together in any setting. Yeah, absolutely. And then you put, especially in the media. All of that stuff. And look, I wasn't the sample size that we discussed. So Mm. photo shoots were really stressful for me. I would go to these photo shoots and the girls would fit into whatever they were going to fit into. And the only thing I fucking fit into was the shoes. You know Mm. what I mean? So... Um, it was hard and but I, I guess the sad part for me again um, and it's taken me a long time to be able to get to a point to be able to say that I'm a talented singer within my own right those girls were really good at high notes and big runs and big tricks and big licks and that's not the sort of singer I am and I compared myself to that and again it just it, it set me up for that thing of like I don't belong here. I'm not good enough. I don't. I don't belong. Tell me about how the Young Divas, how we finished, and how things escalated once the Young Divas had kind of dissipated. When the Young Divas finished, you know, it was um, it just ended due to circumstances, and you know, by the point where it came to the end, there was a lot of. Um, questionable things that happened on a management level and there was money that went missing and there were like the, the trust had gone um and I feel like the trust had gone and there were certain members that just didn't want to recommit for a third round mm. um and by that point like my drug use had really picked up and I was using a lot more and and that um that that scale of like being able to be this celebrity um face in a public space and being able to use drugs the way that I was using um the scale was starting to tip the other way um and I I guess when the divas finished there was this downtime why everybody regrouped um as to what was going to happen next Mm. um yeah and 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 look what happens from here uh, just to just like it, it gets really messy and it gets really ugly and I I um I have a lot of blurry moments and I have a lot of stuff that I don't really understand and I've got a million using stories and I've got a million horror stories and I've got a million stories about how I fucked up another opportunity and another job. Uh, but if I went through all of them, we'd be here for a really long time. So I'm just going to I'm just gonna stick with the parts that were pivotal moments that changed the course of my life, I think, like on a fundamental level. Yeah. 
Um, and look, it, through that idol, through that divas, um, after that happened, I, I found a drug that really changed my brain chemistry, I think, um, and, and did some permanent damage to my brain. And, and, and we'll get to ice and meth down the way, but, um, you know, that was just the drug that brought me to my knees. But it was from this moment when I got introduced to nitrous oxide, um, which is a funny drug, but when I got introduced to that, that was when I started to use in a way that was obsessive and compulsive and I and the powerlessness within me to control and stop changed. And that was when that scale tipped of like there was, there, there stopped becoming a choice um, and it stopped becoming a conscious choice too. Like it was just, you know, the day would end and I would go to bed um, and I would go to bed and I would, swear to myself black and blue that I wasn't going to use the next day and I meant it and I meant it with every inch of my being when I said it but I would wake up the next morning and before my eyes could even fully open my brain was already planning how I was going to use so um nitrous is a is a is a drug that I had told myself this really cool story about because you could get it at the dentist and and you use it during labor um and birth that it was somewhat safe um, but the way you use it um, in a recreational sense, I guess, is, is certainly not safe. Um, and I, it's, it, it's, a, it's a quick high and it happens every, you know, it's probably only lasts for 30 seconds, but it became like an extension of me and I, it was like oxygen, literally oxygen. And, but as soon as it wore off, that, that level of fear and anxiety and... Um, just that drive and need to do it again um, to remove the fear and anxiety was just a next level and something that I hadn't really experienced before. Can I ask, it might be a silly question, but when you kind of escalated to the nitrous, mm. does coke then just take a back seat? It's like it's on to the next. Yeah, it did. And, and yeah. you know what, that was really common in all of the drugs and as my um, addiction progressed and moved or my – you know, where I was in my life or what was available to me, whatever, it was just like I would just put one down and pick the next one up. And, and, and you know, when I found nitrous, it was like cocaine wasn't doing the job anymore. It wasn't, it wasn't able to cover up or, or it, the solution that I thought that I'd found in cocaine was no longer the solution and the solution was now in the next drug. Yeah, because you almost see a pattern like you talk about the binging as a kid. Yeah. And then you pick up smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And then we pick up Coke. And you can see almost this p pattern of like a stronger substance every time coming in, you know. And we'll talk, you know, obviously about where we end up and it was with meth really. Mm. But you can see how these steps got you there. Yeah. In terms of, okay, I've had – the Coke isn't working like it used to work or it's not giving me the same high. That What's the next thing? Yeah. And so the nitrous – at the time you were taking the nitrous, you were in a relationship. I was, yeah. Um, so through this time – um, through that whole time, I had been in a really, um, my first serious relationship as an adult, um, with a really beautiful human whose name for his own, I have a lot of respect and a lot of love for him and his family. And I, um, well, let's call him Johnny. Um, I had been in a relationship with this person through the whole divas. Um, and he had, he had seen that whole thing for me and he'd been there. Um, and he, look, he, he loved me way more than he probably should have. Um, and I wanted to love him back the same way, but I just, I was just being eaten and, and taken um, by this drug addiction, you know what I mean? And, and it got to the point um, with, with him where he, um, you know, he would get up and this is where that crazy powerlessness um, took over like he would get up and go to work um, and I would be out just running amok you know what I mean I'd be using and, and grabbing at whatever I could um, and then it would come time in the day where he would be coming home and I would just feel sick and there was there was this two parts of me there was this part of me that desperately wanted to be able to be home and be in this beautiful relationship and be the, the partner that he so desperately wanted me to be and fought for me to be um, and then there was just this powerless drug addiction that was that had taken over me like a weed, you know mm. what I mean? And um, 
you know, I, I guess that that's really hard for a, a lot of people to understand. And most people would be like, well, just stop. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you really wanted to, you would just stop. Uh, but I guess if I can relate it back to, to something on a much smaller scale, like how many times have you been scrolling on TikTok and go, I'll just sit here for five more minutes and suddenly you're there and it's two hours later and yeah. you've missed and you've avoided doing all of these jobs that you wanted to do and you and you haven't done the dishes or done your washing and all of a sudden the day's over. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I know that's a really small yeah, comparison it. but. Um, and he wasn't using at all. Like he wasn't in that with you. Um, no, nah, look, when it got. When he, when there was a, when he realised there was a problem and it wasn't fun, he he wasn't in it with me, yeah, um, at all. Um, and he just wanted me, you know, to stop. He desperately wanted me to stop. Mm. Yeah. What happened after that? What's next? So yeah, as I said, like over that, and it's a really blurry times. So I think from when the divas ended, um, from when the divas ended, you know, I think it, it, you know, a lot happened. And as I said, there was a, a lot of second chances on a career level that I couldn't, you know, I, I'd, I'd rally and try and get my shit together to go and re kickstart my career while the other girls were already on their journeys to their new careers, which has been really hard to watch, you know, over mm. the years. It's been really hard to watch those girls have their successes and do what they've done and know that my life choices in that moment stopped me from having the same success, you know. Um, but, yes, from there it was um, – it was about three years and, 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 you know, I would – and I think I was about the only person, one of the very few people that could use drugs and, and put on weight at that point. But I um, I tried to stop a lot of times and had little success and I and I was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and, and putting on more and more weight, which which was propelling me to use more and more and more because I hated myself and those just – that hatred for myself was growing so much and my using got out of control and not through lack of – um johnny trying or me trying like it 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 just i just couldn't and um it got to the point um where my mum and dad came to sydney um yeah they came they came to sydney and they they just had to say sorry they just had to say to him that it's enough you know what I mean you've done all you can do and, and thank you for trying to love her but you've got to let her go it's really weird having your parents break up with your partner yeah. for you but yeah he um and they dragged me back to Bendigo did he did you feel like in that moment he knew he had to let go I think he knew he had to let go a lot before that mm. but he he just yeah as I said he was a pretty special human Mm. so um have you spoken to him since yeah look not a lot um he not to me personally but he would check on in on me from time to time um with my mum and dad he would check in on me um and he still wishes my brother and sister happy birthday every year I think he's but you know what he's he's gone on to find um he's gone on to find the love that he deserved and, and that he always needed and, and, and certainly deserved and he's got his own family and, um, yeah, he's he's exactly where he should be. Well, we're going to wrap it up there for this episode and next episode we're going to really talk about, you know, the meth and, and the headlines and the court cases and it's it's going to be a challenging episode, but we're going to get through it. And then the other side of that is the recovery. So then we'll get to the good stuff because yeah. there is good stuff. There is good stuff there coming. Good it's going stuff. to get um, you know a bit messier before we get there, but it's it's all part of the story. Thank you. <laughs>